you're done, I'll be right back. Don't run off. We're very good. Thank you and good morning. You know, I'd like a, a, a special prayer or something uh, in addition to what's been offered because I just spent the last two hours on the phone with a legislative committee testifying by phone to Juno. And uh, I think it's timely with what we have to discuss. And I'll talk about that in a second. But if I'm a little bit shell-shocked, uh, it's because I just experienced uh, you know, local government in Alaska and I, I have some things to say about it. But <laughs> I, I want to thank... Uh, I want to thank uh, President Jerry Isaac and appreciate everything that, that all the delegates and the directors, all the staff of TCC have done. The TANA Chiefs Conference was absolutely instrumental in this report. We could not have gone to the places we did or had the conversations that we were able to experience without all of you. So I'm very grateful to every one of you. And I want to thank this great organization. I want to thank uh, Victor Joseph for taking me around last night to the reception, which was great. I didn't win a prize. I'm, I'm still waiting for one of those doyon bags uh, that, that, that will tell me it's time to go to the gym every morning. But I'm here to talk about the theme, which is from our report. It's the theme of this conference, and the, the theme is the time is now, right? The time is now. And I was really, I was looking at this online, I was like, oh my gosh, it's, it's from our report. And indeed it is. How many of you have heard about this report, this Law and Order Commission report? Well, if you look at chapter two, it says, reforming justice for Alaska natives, the time is now. And the time really is now. But I guess it raises the question, time for what? Well, the first thing, and this comes into my testimony this morning with the legislature, you know, it really is time now to stop treating the civil rights of Alaska natives as somehow less important than all the other citizens of our country. It's just time. And, and toward that, toward that, you know, we got to have this conversation at all levels. This morning it was the Alaska House uh, Committee on Community and Regional Affairs. They wanted to have a hearing on this report. And I appreciate that opportunity. And they were very gracious, but you know, they, they, they pretty much seemed to agree in all of their questions. They wondered why my friend, Attorney General Garrity, did not show to the hearing, or why he didn't send a single person from the State Department of Law to go. I mean, they had notice of this, and it was important that they hear about this report. And they actually agreed at the end of the call, their action was, we want to send a letter to Governor Garrity. He needs to come, or to Governor Parnell and to Attorney General Garrity, rather. They need to come and they need to, to present to us. And specifically, they need to explain what is the state doing to respect tribal sovereignty in Alaska? That was the question. And, and from that kind of respect, as we'll talk about, is so many good things can flow. So, so we know what's happened in Alaska, and I'm not going to summarize the report, but there's some findings that we need to talk about, you know, as members, members of a family. We need to talk about this problem and then talk about what it means to have this civil rights crisis, which is really what we're talking about. You know, this, this is known to all of you, but the reported rates of, of violent crime in Alaska are very much out of whack with the rest of the United States, as serious as they are in many places that we visited. Our commission spent three years going from Maine all the way across the country and spent more than a, a month total time in the state of Alaska. And we know the underreporting is chronic, but we've got roughly domestic violence rates that are 10 times higher than the US average, 10 times, 12 times higher for rates of assault against women. We have incredibly, incredibly, a suicide rate among young people in Alaska that is so high it rivals Hades. It rivals places outside the United States in its severity. And we have a post-traumatic stress disorder crisis. I know many of you saw President Obama talk in his State of the Union address, and it's great that he's spending time, as is the Congress, focused on PTSD and our returning veterans. And I want to thank all the veterans who are here today. And I want to say that one of the shocking findings of our report is that one out of every four Alaska Native youth suffers from PTSD in this country because they're so routinely exposed to violence. That one out of four rate is the same rate as returning combat vets from Afghanistan. The same rate. 
And so when Commissioner Affy Ellis and I testified a few weeks ago before the U.S. Senate Committee on Indian Affairs, I was very pleased that the committee was there. It's great in D.C. when the weather is bad, which, by the way, means there was about a half an inch of snow on the ground. So all the airports shut down, and everybody was stuck in D.C., and everyone had to stay there and listen to the hearing. And they all came. And I was very fortunate that both the U.S. Senators from Alaska came, Senator Murkowski and Senator Begich. And, and I remember testifying, and, and they both they listened to this, and they said, you know, it really is true that these rates of violence are unacceptable. Senator Murkowski said, absolutely unacceptable, was her quote. Senator Begich said, you know, this report, I appreciate it. He said it was tough to read. He said, I think you were engaged in tough love. That was his quote, tough love. And so I, I want to say that, that what I'm offering today is not a criticism of anybody. I respect those two senators, their leadership. I'm a Republican serving in a role on an independent commission. I have no access to grind. I appreciate all the state officials who are here, including the Alaska troopers who are here, who protected us and, and took us around. Lonnie, I see at the back of the room, really appreciate you, sir, and what your troopers do. This is not a criticism of anybody, and I'm not here to criticize the state officials that lead the state. But I am here to, to talk just plainly that we've got to have a new consensus. And I think that with this leadership and what's happening, it becomes thinkable, and don't be discouraged. We could have a new congressional consensus about Alaska, and it could be around public safety, and it starts with one premise. It's a simple pledge that both U.S. senators need to make the next time you talk to them, which may be very soon, I understand, whenever you see them, whenever you see their staffs. They need to pledge that never again will our country, our Congress, our president, exempt Alaska Natives from the equal protection of laws that apply to every other American citizen in our country. Never again exempt them. And what do I mean? What does it say about the value of Alaska Native life in the eyes of our federal government, in the eyes of state leaders who sometimes support that position? What does it say about the value of life when Alaska Natives are singled out for secondary protection that somehow fine for all the other American citizens, but not for Alaska Natives, simply because of who they are, where they happen to live. How, how could that be? What am I talking about? I'm talking about all the progress that's happening across Native America in our country. So many great things are happening. These are momentous times. 2010, the Law and Order Act was passed, created this commission that I get to serve on, but did a lot of incredibly important things, much more important things. Allowed for enhanced tribal court sentencing, the ability of the federal government in its role in prosecuting and investigating crimes to be much more transparent. A U.S. attorney, as I once was, has to now explain when they don't take a case for prosecution. They got to explain why did we not do that. They have to report on that. The idea of making those officials more accountable is critical. We have the FBI now reporting criminal justice information on a lot of the Indian nations in the lower 48. We have some great things happening. And then, and then, such an amazing development, the Violence Against Women Act last year, provisions combating domestic violence. You know, back in 2007, when I was serving in Colorado as federal prosecutor, we had an idea. One of our Indian nations is the Southern Ute Indian Tribe. And we sat down, the U.S. Attorney's Office and the tribe, and, and we figured, let's try to do a domestic violence pilot project. We'll repeal the federal restrictions, which have said since 1978, and Congress could do this, that tribes lack jurisdiction over non-Indians in criminal cases. The idea is, let's have an amendment so that we can test this idea that in one place, we'll start in Colorado, in one place where the defendants are non-natives, the tribes can take criminal jurisdiction, they can prosecute those cases. We'll see how that goes. As I'll talk in a second, I'm convinced, I have no doubt that, that the juries will be fair. It's been the experience of my career. I've been in front of tribal courts for more than a generation all over this country. I have no question, as a non-native person myself, that those courts will be fair. They'll be fair. Americans are fair people. And you know, we had that concept and we took it in front of the Senate Indian Affairs Committee, Chairman Byron Dorgan, U.S. Senator from North Dakota at the time. And we couldn't get any support, Republican, Democrat, 
The idea was viewed as radical. This was back in 2007, the fall of 2007. And I remember I was so beaten down, I thought, what have I just done? I spent months trying to get this issue. I finally got a member of Congress focused on it. Heck, the, the, the chair at the time of the Senate Committee on Indian Affairs wants to do a pilot project. I was so, so excited and then talk about a crash and burn. Well, couldn't get it out of committee. I had dinner with Charles Wilkinson, who some of you know, who's a great scholar of American Indian law and has worked a lot in Alaska in his career. Charles heard about what happened. He took me out to dinner. He said, Troy, everything takes seven years. Everything worth doing in Native America takes seven years. So what are you talking about? He said, you start with an idea. You keep going. You don't care how negative the response is, if it's the right thing to do. Listen to the Native communities. Listen to what they're telling you. Don't dictate, listen. And just keep slogging away. And after seven years, the ball will be moved. Something good will happen. I said, why is it seven years? He said, I don't know, it's just seven years. Well, I look back, I was so proud because in 2013, the Congress said, guess what? We're gonna have the Violence Against Women Act. We're gonna extend criminal jurisdiction over non-Indians in domestic violence cases. We know empirically in our country that at least 70% of the crimes committed against Native women in our country, in Alaska, in the lower 48, at least 70% are committed by non-Native men. We know that empirically, statistically, beyond a doubt. Some say the figure is as high as between 80 and 85% of all DV incidents. Because of that lack of accountability, they know they can get away with it. Well, Congress decided to create that exception by law last year, last spring. And I remember Charles Wilkinson calling me up. I was not surprised, he called me up. And we had dinner that night. He said, see, I told you so. I said, yeah, but it even took less than seven years, Charles. It's really only six years. And, you know, surprises, good things happen. And that great journey forward. And now we know that, that three tribes are ready to do this now in the lower 48. Three others are on deck to begin to assert this inherent sovereignty that has finally been once again recognized. But that road bypassed Alaska, didn't it? Tribal Law and Order Act exempts, for the most part, everything that happens in Alaska. Congress did that. Section 910 of the Violence Against Women Act, unconscionable, our report called it, unconscionable. How can you exempt Alaska women? Why is Congress telling us that their lives are less valuable than others? And isn't that the message really here? And so I say to you, never again, the first premise of what has to happen with these two US senators, with our respected member of the House, Mr. Don Young, Chairman Young, it's time to commit. Never again will Alaska Natives be exempted from the equal protection of the laws of the United States of America. It's just not gonna happen. Don't put up with it. And good intentions aren't enough. I mean, as Abraham Lincoln said, we have to think anew and act anew. It's not enough to just talk about it. It's time to get beyond that. And if it's tough love, it's still love. It's still love. And I'm not there to criticize them, but it's the great commandment, right? Love one another as I have loved you. Love thy neighbor as thyself. It's, this is not a radical concept. There is no more mainstream concept than to treat everyone fairly. So now is also the time as we do that, it's the time for the state of Alaska to quit fighting against Alaska Natives. I don't understand it, help me. I have tried to do the, the research and I have listened. I've listened to my friend, Attorney General Garrity, for example. And I don't understand why, as I just told the legislature moments ago, in my research, no state in this country spends more money per capita litigating against its citizens than the state of Alaska. They sue all the time. Why? The question is why? Why do they sue their own citizens? What other state does that? I mean, believe me, our, my state's not perfect. I mean, you've seen our marijuana laws, you know. My state is not perfect. <laughs> We're looking to Alaska for clarity on marijuana, by the way. <laughs> but what is this about fighting? Why is everything a fight? And may I please say directly, why does the state of Alaska treat your nations as colonies? Why are you viewed as colonies? Now, 
I've been accused of playing to the crowd on that, but I think I'm fairly uniquely equipped to talk about colonialism. My dad came to the US in 1957 with 100 bucks in his pocket from Egypt, when Egypt was part, had been part, and he grew up as a subject of the British Empire. And I understand a little bit about colonialism and what it means to get through that system. And how did my dad get here? You know, my dad was a very young man at the time of the, a teenager at the time of the Suez Crisis. Some of you are old enough in this room to remember this, but there was a time when Egypt threw off the shackles of colonialism, or they tried to in the 1950s. And they took control of the Suez Canal, well, which is not a remarkable proposition because it was on Egyptian land and it was part of Egypt. And in fact, the Attorney General of the United States at the time, Herbert Brownell, did a legal opinion for President Dwight Eisenhower. Eisenhower asked him, can the Egyptians take the Suez Canal? The response from the Attorney General was, yeah, it's their land. And that was it. And you know what Ike said, a Republican? Ike said, you know, we need to stand with the legitimate aspirations for self-government, for self-determination for the people of Egypt and against the colonial powers because we're not a colonial nation. He, he's, he got involved when the British and the French showed up with 200 ships, some of you will remember, and invaded to try to take this canal back with no legal authority to get their old colonies back to keep them in line. And Eisenhower said, quote, on October 29th, 1956, we must be good to our word, or we are a nation without honor. I mean, a president who can speak in those terms to colonialism, to call it out. He added on the night that he was reelected as president, at the height of the crisis, we cannot in the world, any more than in our own nation, subscribe to one law for the weak and another law for the strong. That's what he said. And you know, my dad, he told me, He's, he's, you know, he was so excited and he told me, when I heard that as a young man, you know, and all these things had happened, I just knew I wanted to be an American citizen. And he was able to get out a few months later and came here and, and thanks to this great country and really, in a way, thanks to all of you. Thank you for letting us come. We really appreciate being able to be in this country. Thank you for the chance to do that. It mean, means a lot that we could do that. And we came as guests, and he wanted to be part of that. And you know, I was flying yesterday from Denver. I live outside of Denver, West Denver, and I flew right over, the plane went right over the cemetery on the west side of town where my dad is buried today. And to this day, he has, on the gravestone, it has an American, a bronze American flag on there. He was so proud to be an American citizen. And you know, we're all proud. But I was thinking to myself, what would my dad say about the way the state treats native nations in Alaska as colonies. What, what might my dad say about that? I mean, given what he went through and how his belief was to come to a nation where that had been called out generations ago by a great American president, Dwight Eisenhower. You know, your nations are federally recognized. That has never changed. Don't let anyone tell you that ANCSA eviscerated all your rights. It's, it's not right legally. I'm just being a lawyer here. It's not right legally. There are very few statutes in our country that have been amended as many times as ANCSA has been. And you know, Public Law 280 is another one. And remember Public Law 280, that was in the 1950s. That was this movement at the time of let's try to assimilate everybody. Let's, without the, the tribe's consent, take criminal jurisdiction, put it in the states as an unfunded mandate. What an outrageous policy. Don't ask the tribes, stick it to the states think it's gonna work? What an absurd policy. And you know, it's been a failure. And to the extent that ANCSA tried to create this grand termination experiment, you know, we need to call that out too. We gotta call it out. Because it was just four years later that President Nixon began a process every president has followed, which is to say no more. We respect local people to govern themselves. And native people have sovereign nations, our constitution respects that, it's, it's right there in the text. And we need to recognize that in our country and go back to that. And you know, the rule of law still means something. In fact, it means everything in our society. So those are the chains that, that, that bind, but you know, they're all statutory changes. That is to say, 
They're laws Congress made, and Congress can revisit them. So when someone says no, don't even think in those terms. ANCSA, what are you saying? It's public law 280. <laughs> I mean, the answer is, let's change it. Let's call out the facts. Let's change it. And, and I, I really think that, that the movement is already underway. So much of it is, is taking place here. And you know, when I see Supreme Court rulings, like the native village of Venati that gets so much attention, it's the same concept. You know, Congress can change it. It's not as if these are immutable, unchangeable laws. And you know, I think what we need to do is to have that discussion. And so the time is now to begin to have that discussion, not in some lawyers dancing on the head of a pin way, but with state officials. First and foremost, we talked about the federal counterparts, but the state officials. And so, you know, I'm really here to say, with all due respect, it's a question that came up on this call today, and I, I want to frame it. The question came up in this legislative call today with, with the State House Committee in Alaska. Well, what is the governor's position on tribal sovereignty? Of course, no one from the administration was there, so it was kind of hard. The legislators were kind of scratching their heads and obviously trying to answer. Uh, there was a person uh, from AFN there. There were a couple of VPSOs. The VPSOs were not piping up, I noticed, to answer the, the legal question. I mean, there, but there was no one. My point is that no one from the governor's office was even there. And then someone went back and said, well, you know, there was this governor and that governor and going back. Look, there's uncertainty about this issue. What is the state's position? The uncertainty is self-created. Clarify the uncertainty. Right here and now, today, today, Governor Parnell, respectfully recognize, clarify, respect Alaska Native Nations on a government-to-government -government basis. You can sign the order. I gather we could write it in the next five minutes, and we could put it on someone's smartphone and send it right down to Juno, and he ought to sign it. What is the alternative? How many more ridiculous lawsuits need to be filed? And how many more lives need to be lost? And, you know, I, I just have to say that, that this idea of fighting endlessly with your own citizens is just not sustainable. And it's time to just call it out. It's time to say we are here to stay. We're federally recognized. We have a sovereign right to exist. We know our communities. We're not people who wake up every morning and say, how can we be unfair to other people? Which is so much of the assumption, isn't it this the assumption? What, what else explains it? This age old argument of the colonialist. You see it in every time and every place if you study history. I don't know if you've all heard about the Ilbert Bill, I-L-B-E-R-T. In 1884, took place in British Imperial India. It's still a fresh memory in India, by the way, because for the first time, the British Viceroy of India said, you know, we have criminal cases, and maybe we ought to have a few Indians on juries, and maybe we could actually have criminal trials, and we could have Indian judges, who at that time were part of the British civil service. We could have them try cases involving British, other British, British subjects who are not Indian. I mean, just very modest concept. You know the government of Gladstone in, in London almost fell over that issue? There was such a storm of criticism. And what card did the critics play? The, the yellow press of the time claimed, you know, if an Indian judge in India ever heard a case involving a British woman, an English woman, her honor would be affected. And, and yes, they actually wrote at that time, she might be raped because the, judge would, the Indian judge would know that this woman uh, was an un, a loose woman because she came in front of him and he would be able to take unfair advantage and use the power of the state against her. You know, it's craziness. You read it, it's revolting. But you know, we hear the same arguments so often today. Plug in YouTube on your phones and put in Grassley, Senator Charles Grassley from Iowa. Grassley, G-R-A-S-S-L-E-Y. I have a lot of respect for our senators and for Senator Grassley, but I didn't, didn't like what he had to say at the time of the VAWA amendments. If you plug in Grassley and put in Indian, just try that, it'll pop right up. You'll see a camera phone recording a town hall in Iowa saying, you know, if we have Indians on 
juries, there'll be Indians there and they won't be, you know, you can't have them hear cases involving non-Indians. I mean, this is sentiment is an enduring sentiment. And it's an ironic sentiment, sentiment, first and foremost. We know in the history of what became the United States, starting in 1639 with the British colonies, there have been, we think, the statistics show, 2007 research that was done, historical research, that about 450 Alaska Native and Native American men were executed and eight women were executed for killing white people. So the death penalty was used starting in 1639 just around 450 times. Do you know what it went the other way? How, how many white people were executed for killing, being convicted for killing Native people in our entire United States history, going back to the British colonies, going back to 1639? Zero. 450 to zero. So it's an ironic argument, isn't it? It's kind of a, what scholars call a baseline problem. Maybe the baseline is misunderstood, right? Those people can't be fair. Well, look at the justice system. But also we know, we know our great history in the civil rights movement. You know, when African Americans finally were respected with the, in the civil rights movement to be able to serve like they were supposed to serve a century before on juries in our country, and not be discriminated against. Did, was it payback time? Did, did, were Southern courts just filled with black judges and juries that could not wait to pay back the white man? Did that ever happen? You know how often that's been studied? Do you know, have any idea how much federal money has been devoted to understand if there is unfairness there? And you know there isn't. Categorically, there's no statistical anomalies in the juries and in the judges now that the system is more open and inclusive. Does anybody doubt the same would be true in Alaska with local self-government, respect, with, with people in this room, with your family members, with elders you respect, with your fellow citizens? Is there any question about fairness? What are we afraid of? What are we afraid of? Call out the argument. And you know, the way to start the conversation is very simple. Government to government basis. Don't just treat Alaska Natives as stakeholders. You are not stakeholders. <laughs> you're, you are members of sovereign governments and treat everyone with that respect. And, and how can these laws begin to change with respect to criminal justice? The commission's report, please read it. It does not say that we're trying to create a giant Indian reservation system in Alaska. I mean. Please. There are a lot of ways to address and, and to have a conversation about land issues. And you know a lot more about that than I do. I know there are many ideas, including some in this report, for what regional corporations might be able to do to convey more land into trust, for example. But the main thing, whatever those discussions are that you have, there needs to be territorial integrity. There, needs, there need to be lines that are drawn where within those lines that are workable lines, Alaska Native nations can govern. They can establish courts and know or, or strengthen the ones they have and know that the rulings will be respected, that they'll be given full faith and credit by the state. If there are questions about jurisdiction, we've got some non-Alaska Natives there and there's a question, deputize them under state law. Provide the training and the tools. Build the capacity, however it's done. You can draw a borough line in Alaska without fighting over land status. You can certainly draw lines that are workable as long as it's done in a government-to-government -government basis with the tribes consenting and the state agreeing together on an equal footing as to what the world can look like. Focus on issues that make sense, alcohol, domestic violence. This, this can be done. This is not an intractable problem. We don't have to fight another century over land status. We can certainly have lots of disagreements, whatever they might be, but there's nothing stopping the discussion today from taking place as long as it proceeds on a government-to-government -government basis. Equal footing at the bargaining table, respect for what tribes are as sovereigns, has to proceed. And by the way, and the state gives you an agreement to look at, a cooperative agreement, that's great, but if it tells you you need to renounce your sovereignty to join forces with the state, 
you might want to look at the fine prints. That is not a basis for government to government consultation and true workable cooperation between sovereigns. That is not going to work. And then from that, so many good things will flow. You know, you look at what has happened, and the state so often intervenes, but you know, they intervene for all the wrong reasons because maybe these fears persist. You know, I was struck by this Edward Parks case in Minto that I read about last year. You know, at first I thought, well, this is great. This is, states intervened because I read the facts. I heard about this case. It was a non-native citizen of Alaska. He beat up, he brutalized an Alaska native woman in that village. He collapsed one of her lungs, broke several of her ribs. He denied her medical care for more than two days. And the state intervened in a child custody dispute after the tribal court ruled he's an unfit parent. Does anyone think that man's a fit parent, by the way? The, the state intervened. And I thought, this is great, the state intervened. It's about time. Then I read the state intervened for Mr. Parks against the victim. And the quote in the Alaska Anchorage Daily News, August 25th, from Attorney General Garrity, quote, we're supporting Parks due process rights as we would any other Alaska citizen, unquote. No, that, that's not what needs to happen. What needs to happen is the state's got to start to look at its positions on these things and make sure that whatever the system is, it is done on an equal basis and an equal footing. So to summarize what we've got to do, number one, we've got to move beyond in terms of the time is now. The time is now for what? Number one, it is time to really push these members of Congress. I respect them all. But you know, they're your servants. They're here to represent you. You know, this right to vote that we all have. You know, people fought and died for that right. And you know, they, they need to serve. They're there to serve. And they need to listen. And so the first step is, you know, no more exemptions of Alaska from the rest of the country. Time to treat everybody fairly. Number two, the state needs to quit fighting with its citizens. They just can, they've got to stop. Maybe it's a bad habit. I don't know. They've got to stop. And, and as an aside, I hope you all have taken the time to read the uh, Supreme Court's petition that came out in this Alaska versus Jewel case. This is the subsistence case, right? The state of Alaska is spending money on a lot of really high-priced lawyers I know, <laughs> and some I respect, too. But you know, I mean, let me get this straight about less than 2% of all the annual game and fish take in the state of Alaska goes for subsistence. 97% is for commercial interests. And we're going to make sure we sue the people who are trying to eat. Am I missing something? Can someone help me? As a state taxpayer, the wisdom of spending money that way on lawyers is questionable, even as a lawyer who gets paid by the word. It's questionable to spend money that way. So stop fighting. Just stop. You can do it, state officials. Nothing is making you fight your own citizens. Nothing is making you do that. There's no law. ANCSA doesn't make you get up and say, I got a suit it this morning. It's just that's not what it's about. It, and then take the time to recognize the sovereignty. And don't just pay lip service to it. Say government to government from now on. And you know, I'll just close by saying, you know, my friend, Attorney General Garrity, I, I've spent a lot of time with the man, and I, I, I appreciate the time he's spent with me. But you know, I, I raised this point with him and said, why don't you just do a government to government executive order? You could write it today. Go ahead and... and say the gover governor will now deal with all Native nations on that basis. He said, there are too many of them, Troy. There are 239 of them. Do you have any idea how long that would take? And you know, it's really easy to answer that question. If it'll take a long time, let's get started. 
let's get started. The time is now. It can happen if you want to do it. And not only that, the law requires that it be done. You're not stakeholders. You're more than citizens of Alaska. You're citizens of your native nations as well, and citizens of our great country. You deserve and, and you're entitled to equal rights and respect for your way of life and for the sacrifice that you make every single day, every single day for our country. And for that, I want to say thank you. I want to say God bless all of you. I, I, I want to thank you for the distinct honor to be here as a private citizen, as a first generation American. To stand in front of a group like this means more to me than I can ever say. Thank you. Thank you. Hey, hey, don't run off yet. Thanks again.